I don't see it at all. <laughs> I managed to get a good uh, still and it made a picture of picture where I can look at the frame. Uh -huh. You can zoom in that and you can see all the detail of all the individual things in the game. So that looks, that's pretty stunning. I did some high definition video and the trouble is I could... Uh, in 1961 compared to three and a half, you know, three to five million dollars from the 1961 mainframe. About three quarters of a million dollars today, not something we could easily afford but nonetheless really cheap relatively in, in those days. And the other thing is, it was basically, if you programmed it, you were the operator, you owned that machine for that time block, and it was easy to run. First computer I ever met where you could turn it on on the switch. <laughs> Picture, this, picture, this picture was taken in the, on the production test floor on the later, around 1960. Yes, yes, after their special The uh, tell you a little bit about the machine here. Well, this is fine, I've got to turn the our vertical. Uh, these is, uh, let's play music. You play music? No, I'm good. Yeah, a little bit. You can actually be happy to uh, so, we're going to have a little extended demo because uh, what we normally do, uh, well, Steve is working on this. Uh, uh, this machine is, uh, is an 18-bit uh, uh, fixed word length. Uh, it has uh, roughly a 5 microsecond uh, memory cycle time. It has about 30 some instructions. Uh, each instruction takes about one or either one to two memory cycles. Uh, multiply and divide uh, are very long. Or I think the multiply is about 30 uh, memory cycles long, and divide is as you can imagine, probably a bit longer than that. Uh, the machine has core memory, magnetic core memory, non-volatile. So the, uh, the software that uh, or programs that you have loaded uh, at the time when you turn the machine off are still there when you turn the machine on. Are you are usually still there? Yes. Yeah, right. uh, and so we don't we, usually we don't have to reload the tape here, but um, Steve is showing you uh, how to load. Uh, uh, the pick tape was the high speed pick tape reader. And it reads uh, uh, when it's running full out, uh, 400 characters per second. Uh, there is a pick tape punch uh, to a speed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the tape mm -hmm. So this is a uh, box, a uh, concerto uh, number one in G. The, the third movement it only lasts a couple minutes. Uh, this is being uh, played by a program that uh, Steve loaded called The Player. And um, the interesting, the, the way it's doing this, the way it's actually generating the sound, <coughs> uh, if you kind of look at these, these first four indicator lights here, these are program flags. And the, um, uh, the program can set those. Um, and those four I.O. bits, or, or a flag disk are uh, filtered. They, the electrical pulses go through a little RC uh, filter, and then they go right into two of the bits, go into the left channel, two into the right channel of this vintage heat kit hi fi amplifier, and then out to the speaker. So, what the player program is doing is it's actually toggling those bits uh, to one or zero at um, audible rates to generate these tones. The, System, the computer can generate four tones simultaneously. Uh, uh, if your composer score happens to contain that, and the interesting thing about the player is that when we were working on the archives, we um, found uh, a box of tape case uh, addressed to Pete Sampson, and he happened to come and uh, join us one evening and looked at this box and he recognized that he was the Peter that they were, the little note, handwritten note, referred to. 
and these were data tapes. Um, and so he took the data tapes, he reverse engineered the format, reconstructed the player program, which he had originally written in 1961, mm -hmm. uh, uh, rewrote the assembly language, assembled it, uh, punched the binary, came, loaded it, and then we could read, the computer could read and interpret those data tapes, and we had. There is a companion program called the Harmony Compiler, which he also wrote in that year of back in 61, 62, which, in which you take a composer's score and you, uh, you describe it in uh, alphanumeric characters, and the compiler then takes that notation and creates the data tape for uh, up to uh, four different voices, if you will, four different concurrent voices. So if you had a the display is, uh, is 1,024 points by 1,024 points resolution. It is uh, a point plot type system. It's not vector. It's not raster scan. Uh, the computer uh, specifies an X address <laughs> and a Y address on the screen, and then a plot command, which all of which takes about 50 microseconds to light up one pixel. Uh, the phosphor, this is a sort of a World War II era um, Go for it, Frank. Uh, Man. radar CRT yep. screen. Take them on. So it has a blue-white, very fast phosphor, and then a kind of yellowish, uh, uh, green, long phosphor, which gives you kind of that smearing uh, tail, and you know, that's sort of very characteristic of World War II and what is there after the radar. Okay, radar shot, right? realizing that there's no way to you know, so I, I'm going to let Steve talk about Space Force and he is the writer of it. I'm pointing the wrong way. The uh, first version of Space Force just had two spaceships and no gravity. <laughs> but you can maneuver the spaceships. You can rotate left, rotate right, fire your rocket, get some thrust, and fire the torpedo. The torpedo is uh, <laughs> both an offensive and defensive weapon because it blows up other torpedoes and it also blows up spaceships. So if you can hit the other guy with a torpedo, he'll blow up. Um, when I, uh, oh. Peter Sampson, <laughs> uh, trying to use some kind of orbital. Uh oh. Oh. Oh, oh got him. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Peter Sampson wrote a program called the Kids <laughs> Planetarium. Uh, we, I incorporated the space war, and Ned Edwards looked at my code and said, "Oh, I can make it run faster." And he wrote, he wrote a special purpose compiler to compile the outlines with exactly the right code to compile to display the outlines of the compiler at full speed of the display. And that gave him enough time to do two square roots to compute the effect of gravity on the spaceship, between the sun and the spaceships. Uh -oh. uh, but there wasn't time to compute the effect of gravity on the torpedoes. So we decided they were photon torpedoes, not affected by gravity. <laughs> Oh, well, Star Trek hadn't even been filmed yet, right? <laughs> Had Star Trek been filmed when you started writing this? Oh, no. Uh, the, uh, the this is the 1962 version. This is 1962. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there, there is hyperspace. So where did, you, where did you get the names for everything, like hyperspace? And oh, uh, yeah. well, the space race was very, was very much in the news, and I had just finished reading... Uh, Doc Smith's monthly series. Ah. And uh, so, uh, and if you discover you're in the center of a storm of torpedoes, there's the hyperspace button, which causes you to jump into hyperspace out of all those torpedoes. Unfortunately, the hyperfield generators <laughs> were rushed in the service and they aren't very well controlled. <laughs> so, uh, you get the positive in some new random place on the screen with a random box of us. And the hyperfield generators are very unreliable. No ship has been known to survive more than seven jumps in hyperspace without <laughs> explosion. <laughs> so how do you pull those random figure random positions and stuff like that? Um there's a crude random number generator and uh, it gets kicked many times every cycle for the uh, length of the rocket exhaust and the position and the direction of the sun is far. Yeah. And so it gets run a lot. And uh, 
it's random enough. <laughs> Where do you pull the seed? <coughs> what? The seed for the for the random generation? Is there? Um, I, it's it's okay, not wonderful. It's, it has it's not a it's not a classy algorithm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but what was your seed input? Well, it's, I I think it's Time a day add or? shift thing with something non-zero. It just gets kicked uh, several times every display cycle. Yeah, and the user uh, so interaction is slow so compared to that. It's pretty random. It's random enough so that you can't tell the difference. So who is the champion around the office of this? <laughs> uh, well, I do fairly well. I'm not perfect by any means. Um, but I was forced to play a lot in order to test it. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think of Nolan Bushnell's version? Uh, <laughs> well, the, the um, I haven't played Nolan's version. Uh, Bill Pitt's version was reasonably faithful. And... Uh, the Vectrix uh, Asteroids uh, really demonstrated how to make it a good arcade game, a popular mm. arcade game. They sped up the pace, which they could do because they had faster computers, <laughs> and they uh, added uh, viscous space, which is unrealistic, but it has the great property that when you take your hands off the buttons, the spaceship slows down so you can understand what's going on. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and that makes it a lot easier to learn. And the controls, except for hyperspace, are still around with asteroids. No, I didn't have an assembler. I wrote the assembler code, and there was an assembler. One of the reasons I wanted to use the machine was because yeah. there was an assembler and an assembler and They had got this word ETX0 a little bit more, and so they just translated it over to each one. And so you can type in the uh, location, the system for location, and then program slash to type out the content. Uh, and as an instruction, you do a lot of the computer components and more symbols. And you then type tab. Also, we type out the content. So the parents of the file of numbers, it was really a great way to do it. It does not exactly. It's a long time to take out to catch on and perfectly use it right now. That's the way you would be on programs now. Oh, um, when a spaceship falls into the sun, uh, it gets deposited at the point. And uh, by ignoring all the flow, when you go off this side of the screen, you come in the corresponding place on the other side, and similarly from the top and bottom. And if you think, if you follow through that, the corners are all one point. So how does it feel? How does it feel? How does it feel to have launched a multi-billion-dollar-a-year industry? What? How does it feel to have launched a multi-billion-dollar-a-year industry? That's one of your appreciate. Really well, no. But, well, certainly, but uh, was, I mean, you guys, and, uh, the fellows at MIT who did the tennis game. I think it's more, uh, it's more like unleashing the curse of video games upon the world. <laughs> <laughs> Do you play any other video games today? Oh yeah. Such as. Oh, I play uh, Solitaire when I'm waiting for the compiler to finish. But on those who can the words and stuff. Uh Star Man is another five hundred so it builds up more than four thousand people want to come in.